Amen. Praise God. Amen. Come on. We a amen. 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 Original music. Amen. I, I'm just I'm just gonna set that one right there for a second. Original music. Amen. You you could be getting what they're what they're uh, playing on WPEG right now, or WBAV, or uh, I forgot the what what 105.3 is. Amen. But you you could be getting that music right now but the lord saw fit to give you original music so that when we praise when we worship him when we celebrate him can anyone say that we took their worship we took their song a amen amen in fact the only person that could say that is god and we know he's not going to say that at all. Amen. Amen. Of course, I will be having te technical difficulties right now. Amen. Praise God. What is going on? Oh, here it is. Hey, no, 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 no. It's with my computer up here. It's not with the audio. I'm sorry. Yeah, got the people behind the scenes like, what? Wait a second. It's, it's the computer up here. Amen. We got it working. Amen. Praise God. Let's do this. Amen. Uh, I want you to pray with me. Amen. Before we begin this sermon here this morning. Amen. Let's do this right and in order. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we come to you today, this moment, this hour, asking you, God, to spend time tabernacling with us here at First Fellowship Charlotte. God, we need to receive a word. We need to be edified, encouraged, and equipped, empowered, enabled, uh, consecrated, ordained, educated, confirmed, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, just a myriad of things we need to have done at this time, God. And the truth is, they will only happen if you, God, would see to it. So, God, we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit, that you would bring your Son, and that you would show up during this service, that you would remove everything that's of us, God, both pastor and people, God, so that, God, your word goes forth in all ways and in all manner, so that everyone under the sound of my voice whether it's here in the sanctuary, whether it's live stream on BotsCast, whether it's FaceTime, Facebook Live, whether it's YouTube playback, that no matter where they are, God, that God, they are just blessed, favored, and anointed with your presence, with your power, and with your love. Father God, is in your son's mighty, matchless, marvelous, magnificent name. We do pray. Amen. 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 If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the Gospel of Luke. Amen. We're going to look at Luke chapter 6, verses 17 through 20. And then verses 27 through 38. Amen. I want to make you laugh while you're turning to that. Uh, one of our young people were, was in here sitting back in the back row pouting and looking at me. So I walked over to him and said, what's wrong? He said, I don't want to talk about it. And so I, I said, oh, Lord, that's that preteen coming out. And so uh, two minutes later, my mother walked over to me. She whispered, she said, he's mad that we're not having Sunday school. And she was feeling, I said, uh-uh, I, I said, I wish I'd get everybody else mad in here because we're not doing things for God. Amen. Praise God that he's the only one in here mad. Uh, if only we could get uh, 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 the other folks up in here, other folks to have that much passion for God. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Luke chapter 6, verses 17 through 20, verses 27 through 38, the New Revised Standard Version reads as follows. Jesus came down from the mountain with his disciples and other followers and stood on a level place 
with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear Jesus teach and preach and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And everyone in the crowd was trying to touch Jesus, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then Jesus looked up at his disciples and said, jump to verse 27 with me, but I say to you who are listening, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other cheek also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who asks of you. And if anyone takes away what is yours, do not ask for it back again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive payment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. Instead, love your enemies. Do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for he himself is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over with will be put into your lap for the measure you give will be the measure you get back. Thus far, the word of God, you may be seated in the presence of the Lord God Almighty. Amen. Praise God. Amen. The title of this morning's sermon is The Countercultural Ministry of Giving. The Counter cultural ministry of giving. Amen. Amen. I don't want you to worry. I'm coming down there on the floor in a little bit. I just need to be up here so I can remember some things. Amen. Brother Ronald, I'm getting to the point now. Amen. The memory is not as reliable as it used to be. Amen. Amen. It's gotten so bad that uh, the wife and the children have and the dog have made me a shirt with all their names on it. Amen. And I realize what that is. So if I ever get lost, you find one of those persons on the shirt and send me home. Amen. Amen. All right. So uh, I, I, I'm coming down there. I just need to look at some things right quick. So make sure I get this out for so what God wants me to say. Um, you know, I really appreciate fellowship and I, I, I appreciate fellowship, the our praise team, because they uh, do me the solid of not having to sing. Amen. Hey, hey, uh, stop, Sean. Amen. Sean, you su you supposed to say that's all right, Pastor. You can sing whatever you want to. Hey, hey, th th thank you, Pastor Wesley. Amen. 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 So I, I, I already see he's going to get in heaven from this sermon and who's not. Amen. Praise God. A amen. I, they, 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 do, they do me a solid. I don't have to sing. Amen. And, and that's a good thing because as we know, there are many gifts that God has given me singing is probably not one of those gifts. Amen. Or at least he didn't give it all to me. Amen. He gave me maybe a drop of the gift where he gave everyone the full dispensation. Amen. And so, uh, uh, singing is not my thing, but there are, I love to sing. And in loving to sing, there are times when I walk around, uh, I, I'm, I'm doing whatever I'm doing, and God will bring uh, to my remembrance songs that I have sung at some point in my past. And one of 
one of the songs that I remember singing was a song that I used to sing when I was a child growing up, uh, amen, in church, amen. When I was at church every Sunday during the offering, Pastor Leslie, they would sing, you can't be God's giving, okay? It was, you can't be God's giving, no matter how you try, the more you give to him, the more he gives to you, so keep on giving, because it's really true that you can be God's giving, no matter how hard you try. Amen. That's the song that we sung whenever it was time to give offering. Now, you, you get why we would sing it there at the offering. Amen. But but he, he, here's the thing. The song is more than simply about giving an offering. The song is about God's ability to provide us with more than we give him. Amen. Pray, pray, praise God. That God gives us more, opens up the windows of heaven, pours us out more, literally bless us, bless us with more. And here's the thing. If you really wanted to see how much God could bless you, then give. Now, this inside itself is somewhat amazing. And let me tell you why. It's somewhat amazing because we operate under the perspective that I will give no more than I receive. Okay. Uh, the most I'm going to give is what I receive. Amen. Th th that's how we function in our individual relationship. The, the most I'm going to give you is what you give me. So if you don't give me more than X amount, I'm not giving you more than X amount. Come on now, if you don't give me but so much respect, I'm only going to give you so much respect. If you don't spend but so much time with me, you only get so much time with me. If you, uh, if, if you don't tell me that you love me or you only tell me that you love me once a day, then you're only going to be told that you're loved once a day. That is a mentality we we operate in. Ain't no need to sit here and pretend that that is not what how we operate. That's how we operate. In fact, it's so much how we operate that uh, when uh, I was uh, uh, reviewing uh, Pastor Mark Batterson's uh, fifth chapter of his book, The Circle Maker, he talks about the law of measure. Amen. And in uh, that fifth chapter, when he's talking about the law of measure, he says the law of measure is the exponential return that prayer warriors receive from the Lord God Almighty as they give. And one of the things he does to distinguish the law of measure from the law of everyday life, he talks about how we only give what we get. Amen. And he says what makes this law of measure so remarkable is that this giving is simply not a giving related to prayer. It's an uh, intimacy connected with all aspects of Christian discipleship and stewardship. He insists uh, that the more we give unto God in furtherance of his will, not only for our lives, but for the lives of the people around us, the more God will give to us. Now, he's not talking necessarily about material things. I need us to grow up. 
I need us to mature. And I'm not talking about anyone in particular. I'm talking about all of us. I need us to be able to start seeing God as more than just a spiritual Walmart, a spiritual Target, a spiritual Costco. He's not simply a provider of things. He's a provider of means. He's a provider of resources. He's a provider of opportunity. He's a provider of forgiveness. He's a provider of, uh, of increase. He's a provider of education and edification. He's a provider of consecration and consolation. He's a provider of it all. And we've got to see God as more than just the provider of things. God is not here just to get you a new Bentley, a new Beamer, a new Benz. God's not here so you can pop your collar. God is here because he's trying to fulfill a specific purpose. And he's asked you, and maybe ask may not be the right thing. The pastor said, I don't remember being asked, I remember being told. He's told us to come alongside of him and to meet him where he's at. Now, here's an ironic thing about our God. It's one thing I've learned about our God is whenever he shares anything with us, he doubles down, he doubles down on it. Amen. I found whenever he's talking to me, whenever he's telling me something that I need to know, I need to do, he doubles down on that thing. Amen. Uh, and while I'm reading the law of measure, I keep feeling in my spirit and keep remembering in my mind, I think I've uh, read something similar to this. I, this is not the first time I've seen this. I've seen it someplace else. And what happened, God jogged my memory. He took me back to a book that I read months ago. Amen. I was introduced to this book by Dr. Sadler. I'm so happy uh, that he introduced this book to me. In fact, when I was introduced to it, I was introduced to the audiobook version of it. And the audiobook version was so good that I went and bought the actual book. And I've read through the book now three times. It's, it's a short book. Book. It's probably only 100 pages. The name of the book is called The Go-Giver, a little story about a powerful business idea. The Go-Giver, a, a little story about a powerful business idea. It's written by Bob Berg and John David Mann. In this uh, book, in these 100 pages, is a story of a guy who works at a corporation. Amen. He's in sales. Amen. Uh, his, his, his success is determined by the number uh, of dollars he makes in sales. And so what is happening, uh, the market is down. His his business is down and he's trying to get his sales up. And so he hears about this guru, this old guy that seems to be able to work with people and send their sales through the roof. And so he asks to be connected with the guru. The guru connects, connects with him. And so each week they go to lunch. And on the first week they go to lunch, they go to this restaurant. Amen. And when they get to the restaurant, the first thing that John or Joe notices is that the line for the restaurant is wrapped around the block. And so he's saying to himself, it must be high cotton. It must be something special about this uh, restaurant. And when he walks in and sits down, he's surprised and shocked that the restaurant is really an average restaurant. There, there is, there's, there's no fine china. There's no fine crystal. It's the ordinary standard fare uh, 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 silverware and plate. And, 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 and cutlery uh, and flatware that we would normally see. And so he's sitting there at the table with his, uh, this guru and the owner of the restaurant comes up and, and, some, and they're talking at some point, Joe says, I got to know, what is it about your restaurant? Is it the food? Why are people want the line out the door? Why, why do people beat, down, beat the door down to come get to see you? And what he learns, he learns about the law of value. 
okay? The law of value in this book is a law that says that in order to be successful in business, you must give your clientele more value than they bring to you. Amen, amen, a amen. He, so, so, so this restaurant owner ha has this restaurant, amen. He's serving food. The value people bring to him are their, are, are their money to pay for the food they get. But he understood that in order for him to be successful, he had to give the people eating at his restaurant more value than they brought in. And so for him, giving the people more value included remembering their names. Do you know what it's like to be someplace and someplace somebody remembers your name? Let me make you laugh. Amen. I grew up here in Charlotte. Those who grew up here are going to remember this name. Amen. He served on city council. Remember a man named Al Russo? Amen. Amen. Mr. Russo had his jury, his jury shop, Brownlee juries. Amen. Amen. Uh, when I was in junior high, rap was a hot thing. Amen. And so we would see these rappers. Uh, come on, uh, come on, Meredith. Don't act like I'm the only one. Amen. We had the shell toed Adidas with the bit flat, fat shoe strings. Uh, a a amen. Come on. A amen. Cause, amen. She ain't gonna be real with me. Amen. Come on. A a a amen. Praise God. We and he had the. We used to call them the Dookie uh, chains, the bit fat chains. They were hollow. We didn't know they were hollow, but the bit fat chains. And, and, and we, everyone went, so, so here I'm in junior high, I ain't got no job, I ain't got no money. And so I had a chain, I had, I had a chain. My, mine wasn't, it was, it was a little serpentine, uh, 16 inch, uh, about, about that big, amen. But I had my chain, and so what would happen, because it was so thin and so fragile, it would break all the time. And so when it broke, my father said, well, that's it. That, you done broke. You, you, you didn't deserve it because you didn't know how to take care of it. Da -da. I mean, just went off the deep end. Amen. Uh, a, 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 amen. And so what happened one day, I don't know how I found out about Brown Lee, but I found out about Brown Lee Jewelry and they repair. And so what I did one afternoon when I got home, I didn't tell my parents where I was going. I didn't tell what I was doing. I got my little broken necklace. I walked up to Brown Lee and I walked into the store. I had $3 in my hand. And it just so happened Al Russo was sitting at that desk. And I walked up to him and I said, I need help. He said, how can I help you, young man? I said, I got a necklace, it needs to be fits, and I only have $3. Can you do this for $3? And you should have seen him, he, he played along with it. He's, he's like, oh my God, not another $3 repair. And he hollered back, we got another $3 repair out here. And I'm sitting here like, you do $3 repairs? And my eyes are getting bigger and bigger. He said, yes, sir, I do. He said, what's your name? I said, well, my name's Allie Kennan. He said, Master Allie Kennan, master. Here I am, a little 11, 12, 13 year old boy being called a master. He said, what's your address? I gave him my address, telephone number. He said, he said, this is what I want you to do. He said, I'm not going to take your $3 right now. He said, but I'm, so I'm going to give you a little bag with my information on it in my car. You put your $3 in there, you hold it, and you bring it back. He, and he said, oh, so I was going to he said, by the way, next time you come in, you, Al, ask for Al. He said, we're Al's. He said, you, Al, ask for Al. And guess what? I came in the next time. He said, it would be about a week. So when I came in there, I brought my mama this time. Amen. My mama couldn't believe that a jewelry cover was going to fit something for $3. So she just had to go. My dad thought I was stealing something. Amen. And so, so I took in there. And I came to the door before I could say hi. Miss Russo, he hollers out, hi, Al. I said, hi, Miss Russo. He said, I, I told you, my name is not Miss Russo. My name is Al. Because we're the only two owls in here. In fact, I had a jacket from, from school. Um, I ran a track and said, I had on the back, owl, owl. He said, we're the real owl, owl. Me and you. 
and he remembered my name. And, it, and so what happened, that wasn't the only chain I ever got. I got another chain. And when that one popped, guess where I went? Al Russo. Started buying little cheap, they used to make the little cheap rings and whatnot. They probably got fifty dollars. So you get your little ring that had the, the Mercedes Benz sign on. Get I went there, went kept going back because Mr. Russo, Al Russo gave me so much value, gave me, he confirmed my self-worth, my identity. He made me realize that even though I was a young black boy, I was as important to him as a cat that walked in with a brand new Bentley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the law of value in the gold giver. It's the same thing as, uh, uh, as, uh, as, uh, Pastor Mark Batterson's law of me measure that if you give more to God, then God will give you more back. In fact, you no, know, if you give to God, God give more to you back than you gave. Amen. N now, now, now let me deal with this because I told you in the title of this sermon is the counter cultural ministry of uh, giving. Amen. Amen. Uh, the key word I want you to pay attention to there is the word countercultural. And I want you to pay attention to the word countercultural because we're, when we use that word, we're saying that something goes against what is normal. Amen. That the normal uh, 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 the, the, the normal course of action does not occur. That something goes the opposite way of what's normal. Amen. Praise God. And what we find in Luke chapter 6 during Jesus' teaching is that many of the lessons, many of the instructions he gives us, he teaches us, are counter-cultural. Amen. Praise God. He said, he says, someone smacks you in the face, turn the other cheek. Come on, black folks. Ain't nobody mama in here told you to turn the other cheek. In fact, in fact, your mom, that, that, there you go. Your mama, this is what your mama said. Your mama said, you better not be out there starting to fight, but if someone hits you, you better hit them back. I share with you one Sunday what my father said to me. A little boy hit me in school. I wouldn't fight back. He pulled me into the other room, pinched my nose, and said, if, if that boy hits you again, you ball up your fist and you hit him in his mouth. Hey, let me tell you, yeah, my dad was nice and he was soft with all y'all. He was not quiet and soft at home. Amen. And he sure enough told me, and that's what I did, because that's how black folks we are raised. We aren't raised to start it, but we doggone sure gonna finish it if you start it with us. Amen. Here's, a, here's another one. Uh, uh, do not hate your enemies, but love them. Counter-cultural. And, and, and Jesus is trying to help us understand that if we are going to be disciples and stewards of God, if we're going to be kingdom citizens, kingdom citizens live counterculturally. That means that kingdom citizens must understand giving counterculturally. You know, the one thing that I am always amazed about. Um, with church folks is that we can have the best of time. We can sing, we can be on a high spirit. We can sing the songs wonderfully. God could come down and personally massage my vocal cords so that I sound like Luther Van Dross. I said, but, but, but the problem that occurs every single Sunday at every single church, what kills the spirit is the instant we get to the offering section of the service. I don't care where you are. It, it, it happens at Bishop Jake's church. They be all in the spirit until it's time to do the offering. All of a sudden, it drops. Him and his people have to bring it back up again. Why? Because we have in our mind that whatever we've got, whatever we received, it's ours. 
Come on, tell the truth. Shame the devil, Sister Ramona. You've been there on that job working nine to nine. You're supposed to only been there nine to three. But because you're such a faithful uh, uh, disciple, you stay in overtime. You don't work hard to make that uh, $832,000 a year salary that you're making. Amen. Praise God. Amen. And you be John Brown if First Fellowship going to get more than $500. God don't bless you to make eight hundred thirty-two thousand dollars, but you, you, you ain't, ain't church ain't getting more than five hundred dollars. Cause guess what, the church ain't taking my money. That's how society thinks. I work for it, I got it, it's mine. Not realizing that here it is, everything you have, God has given it to you. Because before you got a salary, you needed a job. And the last time I checked, you were down here pray, asking me and all the saints to pray with you that you get a job. Therefore, the job you got is a job God gave you. If God gave, if God gave you the job, then he also gave you the salary. In fact, your salary is really a loan. Because if you don't act right... Amen. I want you to get this. I, I, I'm not saying R-I-G-H-T. If you don't R-I-T-E, if you don't, no, and you don't act, not act, act right. Amen. I want to give you the street ghetto version so that you understand this. If you don't act right with God, God will take it away. I think all of us have lived long enough to have experienced God taking something from us because we didn't act right with him. We didn't trust him. We didn't honor him. We didn't glorify him. We didn't praise him. We didn't worship him. We didn't magnify him. We didn't expand him. We didn't do any of these things that he wanted us to do. And so what he did in turn, he took away that which we made little gods. God's a little G. Amen. Someone here has been married before. But for some reason, you and he, he and you acted a nut. And so what happened, God had to separate you and him, him and you from one another. And here it is what you had. Because everyone looked at you and said, oh, they got the perfect marriage. Look at them. Hey, look at Danita and Terry. They're just the perfect couple. They're so in love. They hold their hands all the time. And next week they divorce. What happened? Because you something you did, and God said, All right, easy come, easy go. I'll take it from you. How many people have been out here because you didn't respect the power of, of debt? I'm telling you, ain't nothing like losing something to debt that make you respect it. Amen. I, I know I ain't the only one. Amen. You were indebted to something and you didn't really think the people would come back and get it. And what happens? You mess around and woke up one morning and they came back and got it. Here it is. You calling the police trying to find it. The police call you back and say it ain't stolen. Is that it's with your debt recovery uh, agent? That's because you didn't respect God enough to pay to be a, a, to operate in integrity and pay back what you borrowed. And so God said, okay, since you're going to operate in integrity with the debt company, let me let them take it back. We experience loss all the time before because we don't honor, cherish what God has given us. And so God is telling us even in our understanding of giving, our, 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 our understanding must be countercultural. That when I come here to give my offering, I'm not giving it to Pastor Al. I'm not giving it to the Board of Finance. I'm not even giving it to First Fellowship Charlotte. I'm rendering unto God what is God's. Okay? I'm giving God what's God's. Because the truth is, you didn't have a window. Well, okay, I'm about to mess it up, so let me not say it. Amen. Because you know what I'm getting. About to mess it up. Amen. You, you ain't got the what to do it, to pour the what, the what out of. Okay. Amen. Amen. And here came God to give you both a pot and a window. 
and you got nerve to tell God that you ain't going to, what? In the words of Steve Harvey, what? Put some what on that. What? No, Christians understand giving differently. We understand that giving is a source of life. And I'm not just talking about what you give in tithes and offering. I'm talking about the giving you give in everyday life. Amen. Amen. Let me, let me go ahead and tell you. Uh, uh, Elder Dozier gives me life. Amen. Praise God. Amen. The way she, her, just her demeanor, her personality, her character, it gives me life. Now, here's the thing. She ain't waking up today talking about, you know, here, let me go around and give Pastor Al life. Because he got died, so let me give him some life. She ain't thinking about giving me life or any one of us. It's just who she is. And guess what? I'm willing to bet you other people say the same thing. You know what? I feel better after being around Elder Dozier. I feel more buoyant. I feel more uplifted. I feel more oh, in, in, in where I need to be. That's giving. You and I have to get to the point in our giving that we realize that our giving gives life. This is why I love to hug you. Because I think I'm giving you a little piece of life. Amen. I know y'all get tired of me hugging. Because I, I sit on your face. Oh, God, here he comes again. He's about to hug me. And, and this is what you do. You, you, you tense up like I'm about to beat you up. Amen. The only, per, the only person that wants to hug me is, is, is Brother Sean. Amen. Hey, that's right. Amen. Everybody else be tensing up on me. And Brother Ron. Do you tensing up on me? Like I'm about to hurt you. But I'm trying to give you something. In fact, what we say when someone dies, don't go over there with your Bible. Don't go over there with your scripture. Just go over there and sit your very dairy self down. Because it's not your memorization of scripture that's going to mean something it's not your theology that's going to mean something it's going to be the fact that you thought enough of the family to take time out of your schedule to give it to them your presence that's a gift of your presence amen say what you want to say about other ministries but there's one ministry that I will not talk bad about because every time we're trying to do something here at this church they come participate with us that's Rainbow Rain. 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 they come out here them guys come out here quicker than we will to help us clean up our own church to get the grounds together that's a gift of their time their, 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 their ability now here's the thing they didn't ask anything for it they didn't turn around, call Sister Wilhelmina, call Deacon uh, Charlton and say, hey, now we were out there for six hours cleaning up. Now, if you would have, we, we had 10 people out there. If you were to pay us the rate that you charge a yard man, then that means we shouldn't have to pay rent for this many Sundays. They ain't done that once. Because they've understood giving counterculturally, that they are giving and they're hoping and expecting that the more they give to us, the more God's going to give to them. In fact, let me, let me do this. Let me challenge you. Amen. I ain't even got where I want to go. I'm just all off the paper. Amen. It's all Meredith's fault. She got back there and she nodded twice when I started talking. And so that told me in my spirit that I'm saying whatever God wants me to say. Look at her. Now she's looking down like I ain't looking up at him no more. Amen. Praise God. Let me, let me, let me, let me say this to you. Amen. Amen. You and I are charged with teaching the world how to live for God. You and I. He's assigned us the responsibility for being 
models that teach the world how to live for God. And one of the things that God wants us to teach, wants us to model for the world, to teach them, is how to give. Amen. So let's do this. Give me the first point. Amen. Let me at least get a point in here. Amen. Because, you know, I, amen. All my theological scholars in here be looking for points. Amen. Again, giving as the Lord God Almighty requires us to be countercultural. Amen. We have to be countercultural, which is what I've been dealing with already. Uh, amen. Uh, and so not to repeat that, let me challenge you on being countercultural this week. Okay. Let me challenge you this week as you're going about your life to be countercultural. Amen. Amen. The culture says, mind your own business. All right. Jesus says, you need to be paying attention to what your neighbors do. Be mindful. Not, I'm not saying get in your business. Be, I mean, be gossiping, Georgia. <laughs> I teach you, I'm teasing. I, not, I mean, getting someone's business to gossip. But I mean, you should be sensitive to the spirit that when someone around you is in need, your spirit is vexed. You should be so sensitive to God's moving that you can be around someone and know they're in trouble. Amen. And that's what God, you need to be, the, you, that's what I mean by you need to pay some, being someone's, but you need to pay, you need to be able to say, Sister Denny, what's going on? You didn't walk in here smelling. You usually walk in here smelling, doing your icky shuffle. Amen. That's usually how you come in on, on in here. Amen. You came in here moping and dragging, face hanging low, looking like you're about to cry. What's going on? Amen. Brother Terry, you ain't been here in a minute. You ain't been. What's going on, bro? Is everything all right? The word around town, you're down there with such and such. Is that true? I hope you're not. Because, you know, they, 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 they usually get arrested. You, I, 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 I think higher of you. I think better of you. I want you to know if you need to hang out with someone, come hang out with me. You ain't got to go down there with them all the time. Amen. These are just examples and not really talking about anybody. Amen. Be countercultural. Here's another one. They got themselves into it. Let them get themselves out of it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Come on, black folks. Amen. Now, that's another thing your mama told you. Don't be around there. If they got themselves into it, don't you get down there and get involved with that. Let them get themselves out of it. Maybe it'll teach them next time to behave themselves, act like they got some sense. But guess what? God doesn't do that with you. You got yourself into the predicament you got yourself into. You got yourself in there because you sinned. And you know what sin is? Let me remind you. Sin at its most essential nature is disobedience. Forget whatever the act of sin is. Something God either told you to do and you did not do. Or something he told you not to do and you did. Got you into it. You got so far into it, you don't even know how to get out of it. And God blessed you by showing up and God stuck his nose into your business so that you can get out of the business you made for yourself. And now you got nerve to say to God and everybody else, I ain't getting in it because if they, they got themselves into it, then they can get this. No, if God treated us like we act, we're in trouble. But God deals counterculturally with us. So why aren't we dealing counterculturally with someone else? Here's another one. I will do something good for someone else, something else, when someone else or something else does something good for me. 
that's a reactionary stance. In other words, you're waiting for someone or something to decide that they're going to be, be a blessing to you. Amen. Christians don't wait to be a to, to, for someone to do something to be a blessing to someone else. We proactively bless. Let me show it to you in the scripture. Jesus went looking for the people he blessed. I know you may say, no, that's not true. Because scripture said, they said he walked up to her. But before they walked up to her, look at, read the scripture. He was someplace else. He left there to be at that city at that time. So when the people were, came looking for him, they could find him. Is that not Jesus looking to bless someone? Remember the woman at the well? She's coming just get water. Jesus coming to bless Amen. Remember the man at the Bethesda? He just wants to get in the water. Jesus wants to bless. You know, I, it, Jesus did not wait to bless others. So why are we waiting to bless others? Amen. Amen. We ain't got to wait. Sister Julie, you ain't got to wait for the rest of them uh, young sisters to uh, call you and say, Hey, Julie, we're going to make you something to eat today. You know, you ain't got to worry about them calling you all the time and say, What you cooking, girl? Amen. Go ahead, bless them. Because God going to bless you back. You ain't got to wait for someone to say, Hey, you, you know, let, let, let me help you move all that trash from outside your house. Go ahead and do it. Watch God bless you. You ain't got to wait. Amen. Uh, for someone to ask you to lunch. You can ask them. Just make sure you don't work with them. Amen. Praise God. I don't want you to get in trouble at the job. Amen. God deals with us counterculturally. So we had to be countercultural. Amen. Amen. Let me see that second point. We're going to start it. I'll pick it up next week. Amen. Let me see that second point. The Lord God Almighty instructs us to be countercultural because that's the way we want other people to treat us. Amen. Amen. The Lord wants us. It starts us to be countercultural because that's the way we want other people to treat us. Um, you know what throws me for a loop? This drives me crazy. Is when I see people do their dirt and then want to hide their hands. When they want to throw rocks and then pretend. They didn't do it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because you know what has happened? Is that we've moved away from that way it was when we were kids. When we were kids, you were told if someone hit you, go tell the teacher and let the teacher deal with it. We don't move away from that. We moved to the place where, screw the teacher, I'm about to whoop your tail. And then what happens whenever someone who we've thrown rocks, we've done dirty, responds, we want to play the victim to their response. This is why I'm at the point now, don't just tell me what they did, tell me the whole story. Tell me what you did to make them respond. Because nine times out of ten, you're telling me their response. Tell me what you said about them. Tell me how you backstabbed them. Tell me how you lied on them. Tell me how you gossiped about them. Tell me how you said a rumor. Let me know the whole story so that I can judge this thing correctly. Many of us, in fact, let me, let me say this. I'm going to give you this example also because I'm going to get to this point right quick. I do represent criminal defendants. And Lord, I don't represent some criminal defendants you don't want to be sitting beside you in church. They, they, they're heinous. They've they done some things that you're like, please God, lock him up under the prison. 
cement around his, his, his cell. Don't ever let him out. And they get to court. They didn't think while they were committing their crimes that their actions would hurt people the way they did. They committed the crimes. They get to court and they want to act like the biggest punks in the world. God, I can't do 40, 50 years. I, I'll, I'll be an old man when I get out. One of the coldest things I heard a judge say, well, at least you'll be alive. It was cold. Because guess what he, the guy was charged with? Murder. Guess what he was trying to tell the guy? You want me to be considerate of your life, to spare your life, not to have your life wasted, but you didn't give the same kind of respect to this victim when you took this victim's life. At least you're going to be alive when you get out. We don't ever want what we give out. We want people to treat us like we should have treated them. And when people give out what we get, give, give back to us what we give out, we get in our feelings. Well, here's the thing. God says if you don't want to experience that, you don't want to go through that, then stop giving it out. He said, I'm giving you a selfish reason for being countercultural. So that you don't experience what it is you've given out. Because guess what? Paul says it. No one who loves himself will harm himself. That's truthful. You know, only person that have mental illnesses will, will, will mutilate themselves, harm themselves. But guess what? You ain't harming yourself. You so bad, pull a tooth out right now. You ain't doing that. That hurts too much. You can think about that. You so bad, cut yourself. You ain't doing that. Not on purpose. You so bad, stick yourself with a pen. We got push pins back there. Go get one. Stick yourself with one. You ain't doing that because yourself, your, your, yourself is about self-preservation. Yourself is not going to do anything that causes yourself to suffer. And if that's how you deal with yourself, then that's exactly how you're supposed to deal with your neighbor. Because you want your neighbor to deal with you as you would deal with you. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Let me just pause right there. Amen. God, oh God, I need you. Help me, amen, because I know y'all not liking this. You should see y'all faces, Lord, have mercy. Y'all looking like I done told y'all heaven is closed. Ain't no more, no more spaces to get in heaven, amen. But here's the thing, what I need you to get. This gospel is not simply a gospel that everything going to be all right. This is not simply a gospel that, guess what, every day is going to be a sunny day. This is a gospel that deals with the ugliness of life. Life was ugly when Jesus came around. This is why people are flocking to him the way that they did because he was truly the light of the world. There was darkness in the world. And guess what? He came to deal with some ugliness. We got we have some ugliness too. Oh, y'all not gonna agree with me? Okay. All right, all right. I was see, see just for that, y'all get another five minutes of sermon here today. Amen. Y'all ever heard of a woman named Dr. Colleen Cal Caldine Gay? You should have heard of her this week. Yeah. Amen. She's a, she's a former first black president of Harvard. Yeah. She was set up by, and it's ironic, she was set up by an anti-Semitist trying to play like she was pro-Jewish, trying to get her out and some other women out of a position as president, it's funny how the devil always sends someone that looks like you. Who looks just like you to get you out of it. And so what happened, she had been, based on the questions that were told, 
told to her that they were going to ask. She had been prepped by her attorneys with an with answer. The answer she gave was appropriate. But no, this anti-Semitist idiot pushed it and tried to pretend like Dr. Gay and two other women were being anti-Semitic. All right. When she gets back to her school, they're pushing, getting her fired. Harvard says we're not going to fire her. Okay. Yeah. Two men, white men. Let me say it. I'm not, I don't even want to mix words. With this. I want you to get this. Yeah. Two white men who had everything. Both billionaires decided that they're going to send their wives after Dr. Gay. And the allegation that their wives made against Dr. Gay was that when she was writing her dissertation, she plagiarized her dissertation. That's an allegation. The truth, she didn't plagiarize anything. The problem was when you're writing these dissertations, each school uses a certain style in how you footnote. So when I was writing mine, well, man, you tell me you, you, this was yours. We had to use Turabian. Did y'all use Turabian? Or did y'all? APA. APA. We, 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 we both have doctorates. I'm sitting here telling you, you're hearing us tell you that there's multiple ways of citation. One way is not, neither way is wrong. It's just if, if the school requires a certain form, that's the form you have to use. We use Turabian. Well, come to find out she didn't use the right form. She asked for a review by the school. The school gave her the review. And not only that, but the school made her changes for her. That's not plagiarism. But here it is, Mrs. Ackerman. I want you to know her name too. The woman that led this, 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 this revolt, this, this uprising against Dr. Gay, submitted a dissertation with blocks of stuff where she has lifted from other people's work that is plagiarism. The one casting the stone is, is it was plagiarizing and then had nerve on Friday afternoon to issue a statement talking about how the media and the world is mistreating her because of an error she made in life. And as Nicole Hannah Jones said later on that night, why is it that you get to claim error in your life, but calling calling gay can't claim it in hers? That's the world we live in. And here's the thing. Let me tie it back in. All right, Jesus, I hear you. The normal response, especially for us educated brothers and sisters in the academy, to get mad, to start pulling off earrings, and start taking off rings, and take off your coat and your tie, and to march across campus and whoop the you-know-what out of those who cause Colleen Gay to lose her position. That, that's, that's the human response to do. But the countercultural way is to pray that God would touch these bigots, these hate mongers, these white supremacists, call them what they are, call them what they are, and to deal with that so that the kingdom moves forward. Now, I know that's hard to do. That's hard to do. You don't work hard. You don't go on above and beyond. Your C was the equivalent of an A plus, 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 plus. That you have to fight for that. And someone comes and tries to destroy everything you do. And here it is. Pastor Al, you're telling me to pray for them? Ninja, please. And y'all know what ninja stands for. Come on, even the most educated of us would be saying, ninja, please. But that's countercultural. 
Amen. So I'm going to pick up next week. I'm going to finish this next week. Amen. I thank you for your patience. I had to lay the groundwork so we can get through this sermon. Uh, amen. Praise God. Let's do this. I'm going to issue uh, the call to salvation and the call uh, to membership right quick. And then we're going to have Holy Communion this morning. Amen. Let me do this. Let me say uh, uh, to someone out there who is wanting a relationship with God but is not sure how to, to get it you've been trying to meet requirements you've been trying to manipulate you've been trying to do whatever but the problem is in spite of all that you've done you still don't feel that you have the relationship with Jesus and God that you need to have let me tell you why that is that's because there's only one way to have Jesus that is accept him through the free pardons of your sins that means you have to be able to speak up to confess that you believe with your heart that you are a sinner first and foremost that you've fallen short of the glory, that you have messed up, that you stand at odds and opposed to Jesus and God. Then you have to confess that Jesus is his God's Lord, God's Messiah, God's Christ, God's anointed one, God's Savior of the world. And then you have to confess that you believe in Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah. And so here, until you've done those three things, amen, that's in the confession of faith. Until you've done those three things, you have not and will not be able to find salvation. But here's the beautiful thing. I want to help you with it right now. I want to help you lead to it. In fact, it's simple. All you got to do is pray this prayer. And I want you to believe in your heart by faith and pray this prayer and you can be saved. So here with all heads bowed and eyes closed, let us pray together. Dear Father God, creator of the heavens and the earth, I thank you God for this day. I thank you God for how God you blessed me to see this day. You didn't have to bless me. You didn't have to uh, 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 bring me to this point, but you did. God, I'm at back at that point where I want salvation. I want to be saved. I want to walk in the fullness of your grace and mercy. I want to know that I belong to you and you are my God. So God, I confess with my mouth that I am a sinner. I am like a sheep. I have gone astray that my righteousness, if I have any to begin with, is but filthy rags. Also, God, confess that while I was yet a sinner, you proved to me how much you love me because you sent your son, Jesus, to die for me on the cross. He had done nothing. He was blemish-free, spot-free, wrinkle-free, sin-free, but you sent him to die for such a sinful, blemished, imperfect uh, creature such as me. And God... I pray right this very moment that you would hear me and believe me when I say I believe that he is Lord. He is the Messiah. He came and fulfilled your will here on earth uh, that God you wanted him to fulfill. And God, he is Lord. I believe in him. And God, I am saved. Father God, I pray that, God, you would hear this prayer. Not only hear this prayer, but enable me, God, to, to mature and to flourish in the spirit so that I may become a faith-wielding, faith-possessing disciple and steward. And when it's said and done, God, come get me. Personally, come down here and collect me. Take me back to heaven to spend all eternity with you. It's in your son's mighty, matchless, marvelous, magnificent name that we do pray. Amen. If you pray that prayer with me, and that's the first time you've ever prayed that prayer, you pray what we call a sinner's prayer. 
Amen. You prayed uh, uh, a prayer of salvation, and you are now a new creature in Christ. Amen. You are now saved. What I want you to do, I want you to reach out to me. I know you may be saying, well, i got to reach out to you. Because here's the thing. You are a babe in Christ. Amen. Praise God. You are a babe in Christ. Okay? You don't know anything about Christ. And just like a baby that is born, nat born naturally, we don't birth you and leave you alone, sit you in the corner and tell you to raise yourself. We birth you. Well, God births you. We don't birth you. God births you. And then we take responsibility for helping you grow up in the spirit. There are certain things that you will not know until you interact and learn it from other like-minded Christians. And so that's why I want you to send me uh, your uh, uh, email or a private message on Facebook that you have received Christ today. Not because I want to be in your business, but because I want you to grow. I want you to flourish as a saint, as a believer in God. So send me that email. Send me that private message. Second call for someone who's saved. You know you're saved. You've given your life to Christ. Problem is you don't have a church home. You do not have a church home. We want you to consider joining us here. Here's the thing. You ain't going to find a pastor that loves you like I do. Amen. Praise God. You ain't going to find a pastor right there. I'm just going to be honest with you. Amen. Now, I, I know there are some good pastors out there. And I know these pastors do love their sheep, but they're not Pastor Al. Not only that, but you ain't going to find a home like First Fellowship Charlotte. This is an awesome place. And we want you to come be part of what we're doing down here. We have room for you. Don't let, don't let someone tell you or make you think that there's no room. There's room for everybody. We will clear out everything just to make sure you have room to get down here. So we want you to join us to become an official part of what we're doing here at First Fellowship. Send me the email. Send me the private message. Tell me that you're looking to join First Fellowship Charlotte. And we will make it happen. We will bring it to pass. Amen? Amen. So, let's do this. It is now time for us to have communion. Amen. Deacons and deaconesses, amen. If you would come forward, amen, so that we can uh, have holy communion. Amen. Amen. Let's